A very good morning. Welcome along, along to Ireland Aim. It's Wednesday, the 11th of January, and we have a busy old show on the way. We do. We're going to be chatting all things pills and prescriptions, the power of positivity, and planning your big day. Here is what's coming up every time. Could every I'm dreading this. I'm planning dreading a big this. Day. We got the notepad out. Ooh, you're it's doing exciting. it. You said you'd do it. Now, with over 200 medicines currently out of stock in Ireland, crazy. We're going to find out what risks this may pose to an already crippled health system. Broadcasting legend a little bit later on, Mary Kennedy, she's going to be talk, uh, stepping out of her comfort zone after retirement, kind of, as uh, she's busier than ever in her career, though, Mary. Plus, his podcast, Feel Better, Live More, big fan, is mm -hmm. the number one health podcast in Europe. One and a half million streams per week. Dr. Rangan Chatterjee helps us mind our mental health. That's coming up after nine o'clock. Such a lovely fella. Lovely so I'm really looking forward to having a chat to him. Alan, mm -hmm. our lovely fella, 1.5 million streams every day. <laughs> we wish. Now, we're going to be finding out the facts behind the fizz of energy drinks. You know, everybody is mad about these energy drinks, but what is in them? What are the ingredients? And what are the health effects? Plus, uh, we've delicious breakfast here in the kitchen. Catching Layden's going to be here. And we have some celeb-inspired style on the catwalk. That's all coming up a little later on. But now, Derek is out and about in a very blustery and cold morning. Where are you, Derek? Yes, uh, well, we're here in Leeds, Slipping County, Kildare this morning. As you mentioned there, it's very cold, wet, quite a windy one. Plenty of scattered showers, risk of hail, a risk of thunderstorm activity. And guess what? We have more rain on the way from the southwest later on this evening. So we'll have more from uh, lovely Leeds, Slip here in County Kildare, right across the board. It's a chilly one, guys. <laughs> I'm cosy. I'm more rain. Who here. would want to be a weatherman <laughs> in Ireland? He's having quite the week of it, isn't he? He is. He really is. It's just rain. There's no and crack. Still always has a smile on his face. Fair play to him. Now it's time to go over to the Virgin Media News Hub. Here is Hannah Murphy. Thanks, Marin, and good morning. The Irish Medical Organisation says bed capacity is the biggest issue facing Ireland's healthcare system at the moment. The group has compared current conditions as being like a war zone and says there's a very real likelihood that some patients may have died as a result of what it claims were avoidable delays in the system. It comes amid a surge in respiratory viral illnesses this winter and a record number of people on trolleys last week, though those figures have dropped this week, with the INMO saying there were 534 patients waiting on a trolley as of yesterday. The biggest problem we are facing at this moment in time is one of physical infrastructure and bed capacity. We had 11,000 and a half roughly beds in, 20, in the year 2000. We still have 11 and a half thousand beds roughly in the system and our population has gone from about 3.8 million to 5.2 or 5.3 million. And if you try and pour a litre of milk into a pint glass, you'll end up with milk on the table and that is our problem. A woman in her 60s has died following a crash in County Donegal yesterday evening. Emergency services were called to the scene of a collision involving a van and a pedestrian on Main Street in Killy Beggs at a quarter to six yesterday. The pedestrian, a woman in her 60s, was pronounced dead at the scene. Her body has been removed to Letterkenny University Hospital, where a post-mortem will take place. Gardaí want to hear from any witnesses and anyone with dashcam footage. Enoch Burke and Wilson's Hospital School are due back before the High Court today. The teacher is seeking an order to prevent his employer proceeding with a disciplinary hearing, while the school is seeking an order for the temporary seizure of his assets to compel him to stay away from the premises. Since classes resumed last week, Enoch Burke has spent each working day at Wilson's Hospital School in defiance of a court order to stay away from the premises. He was jailed last September for refusing to obey the order after he was placed on paid administrative leave after interrupting a school service and dinner to confront the former principal about her request that teachers use a student's preferred pronouns of they and them. He was released from Mount Joy just before Christmas without purging his contempt of court after the High Court found he was using his imprisonment for his own ends to promote his views on transgenderism. But he was warned that if he disobeyed the order again, the school could seek further measures to try force him to comply with it. Wilson's Hospital School, which has scheduled his disciplinary hearing for the 19th of January, has decided not to seek an order for him to be re-imprisoned at this stage, but rather is to ask the court for the temporary seizure of his assets until the hearing. Meanwhile, Enoch Burke is to seek an order preventing the hearing going ahead. Submissions in relation to both applications will be considered by the High Court today. Nicole Gernon, Virgin Media News. 
The cost of sending a letter is on the way up. The price of a national stamp is increasing by 8% to €1.35 from the 1st of February. On Post is blaming inflation for the move and says its prices remain below the EU average. The cost of a worldwide stamp will stay the same. And the move by on Post is just the latest in a long list of price hikes hitting customers. Yesterday, yesterday Diageo confirmed a 12% increase in its price of beers from February. The company said it has faced significant inflationary pressures and had absorbed the costs for as long as possible. The Vintners Federation of Ireland has called on Diageo to reconsider the move. Cardinal George Pell has died at the age of 81. He died after undergoing hip surgery in Rome, where he'd been to attend the funeral last week of Pope Benedict XVI. In 2017, an Australian court convicted him of molesting two 13-year-old choir boys at St. Patrick's Cathedral in the late 1990s. He spent 404 days in solitary confinement before his conviction was overturned in 2020. A long-time executive for Donald Trump's business empire has been sentenced to five months in jail for dodging taxes on $1.7 million worth of job perks. Alan Weiselberg's testimony helped convict the former president's company of tax fraud. The 75-year-old worked with the Trump organization from the mid-1980s and until his arrest had served as chief financial officer. He was handcuffed and taken into custody moments after the sentence was announced and he's expected to be taken to New York City's notorious Rikers Island jail complex. The BT Young Scientist and Technology ex Exhibition will be officially opened this afternoon. It's the first time since 2020 that the event has been held in person after the COVID-19 pandemic forced it online for the last two years. President Michael D. Higgins will formally open the event at the ceremony at the RDS this afternoon before it opens to the public from Thursday until Saturday. The winners will be announced on Friday. And finally, there were big wins for the Irish at the Golden Globes last night, with the Banshees of Inish Aaron taking home three awards. The dark comedy, which saw Colin Farrell, Brendan Gleeson and Martin McDonough reunite for the first time since In Bruges, won the award for Best Picture in the musical and comedy genre. Colin Farrell took home the gong for Best Actor in that category, while director Martin McDonough was recognised for having the best screenplay. Martin McDonough, I owe you so much, man. 14 years ago, you put me working with Brendan Gleeson, my dance partner, and you changed the trajectory of my life forever in ways that I begrudgingly will be grateful to you for the rest of my days. For car insurance, van insurance, or home insurance, call the quote devil. Unless, of course, you've got money to burn. Thank you very much, Ger. We're live here in Leakslip in County Kildare, right across the morning. We've got Alan Fraser with us now on cameras this 11th of the month. And let's pull back the curtains. A bit of a shaky start out there this Wednesday morning. And we have plenty of scattered showers right across the country. In fact, we have a heavy cell of rain uh, hitting parts of Cavan and Monaghan at the moment into parts of Galway, Mayo, East Limerick. And in fact, right along the Kildare Meath border, not escaping either. So rain gear at the ready if you are heading out to in those strong and blustery westerly winds. Now right across today a real mixed bag on offer because it will be a pretty bumpy ride plenty of scattered shares. In fact that uh, those shares merging to longer spells of rain for a time. We're going to see some embedded thunderstorm activity with a risk of hail out there today and then we have more rain from the southwest into late evening so no let up really in that rain those shares out there today. Top Thames quite cool too at 5 to 9 and finally then tonight more shares edging across the island drier the further north we go but still a bumpy one in terms of those winds as they veer to the south still quite strong and blustery working our way into tomorrow and guess what more rain on the cards as we edge across into your thursday with fanny's back to about two to six degrees so that's how we're shaping up here in a chilly leak slip at the moment we we'll catch you back live at 7 35. For first-time drivers, young drivers, returning drivers, if you've had an open claim or have had too many penalty points. It's time now to take a look at this morning's papers. We'll start with the Irish Times. It's headline, walk-in flu vaccines to be offered to children as cases soar. Walk-in flu vaccination clinics are being offered to children from this week as the HSE said nearly 700 under-14s have been hospitalised with the illness this winter. 
The examiner also leads with clinics <coughs> offer flu vaccines for children. Well, patients are stuck in hospital for over six months. That's the front page of the Irish Independent. The paper reports some patients who no longer need to be in overcrowded hospitals are languishing in wards for more than six months because of a lack of suitable step-down care. State pays road toll firms 30 million euro in compensation. That's the top story on the Daily Mail. The state spent millions of taxpayers' money compensating toll operators after traffic dived during the pandemic. But it did not have to do so, the spending watchdog has said. The mirror goes with bravest boy, Alejandro Mizan, aged nine, who suffered horrific facial industries, injuries when he was savagely mauled by a pit bull, has returned home to his family in Enniscorthy after seven weeks in hospital. The son also leads with that story. I'm so happy to be home. The star's front page, Quirk's ex on death drive charge. The ex of murderer Patrick Quirk, who killed Mr Moonlight DJ Bobby Ryan, has been charged with careless driving causing death. And the Herald goes with US actor stalked Irish doc for 19 years. An American actor accused of stalking an Irish doctor was romantically obsessed with her after they had a brief summer relationship 19 years earlier, a court heard yesterday. For three, that story, I can't stop reading that story. For three weeks, she knew him when she was on her J1. It's God bless that poor doctor right. um, and hope she gets uh, justice. Now, up next, the price of beer, spirits and stamps. You're a big stamp buyer, stamps. aren't you? Oh, I love it. He only communicates, when we're not on TV, he only communicates with me in cards. This could be the end of the, the old cards. Christmas cards after this. Anyway. They're all set to rise. We're going to discuss that story and everything else in this morning's papers after the break. Oh, lads, it was a great night for the Irish, wasn't it? Sure great was. night for the Irish Banshees of Inishir and took home a hat trick of awards at last night's Golden Globes. Amazing. Join us for that story and everything else this morning is Jack Corgan Jones. Our entertainment times. correspondent. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jack. I'll great to have you with us. It's yeah. all the fashion ready um, presses. Listen, why not go and hear uh, Colin Farrell with his acceptance speech? It was pretty damn great. Martin McDonough, I owe you so much, man. 14 years ago, you put me working with Brendan Gleeson, my dance partner, and you changed the trajectory of my life forever in ways that I begrudgingly will be grateful to you for the rest of my days. <laughs> Brendan, I just, I love you so much. I love you so much. To get to, to cohabitate this creative space with you every day, all I did when I came to work every day was aspire to be your equal. I'm not saying I even got there, but the aspiration kept me going. And I thank you for that for the rest of my days also. <laughs> mwah. That's how I want to say hi to you every morning. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mwah, mwah, mwah. It must be awkward when someone's telling you that and you I just know, sit yeah. I didn't win anything though, Colin. Um, <laughs> I think the two of them love each other so much that they it's do. just fabulous. So the great, the great romance of A great show, night. Yeah. Like this yeah. film is spectacular. I was sad for um, on Colin Kuhn that it wasn't nominated at it. all. Even it's in the foreign language as well. well. I know, save it for the Oscars, Oscars yeah. but it's just that the, my two favorite from this year. But uh, it, it's lovely and very special. They said thank you to Jenny the Donkey. Jenny the Donkey. Yeah, I think I actually only only watched this film last weekend, and I think that like all the animals in the film are really important. Like there's Jenny the Donkey, obviously, and no spoilers. We won't give away what happens to her. But there's also a kind of you know brooding horse. There's a melancholy collie, <laughs> and so across the board, like animals play a really big part in this film. But of course, not as big a part as the actors themselves, who were recognised last night, particularly Colin Farrell, who won Best Actor in a uh, musical or comedy, and um, Martin was, McDonough as well as Best Director. So yes, yeah, so what were the three the ones? So Martin McDonough won Best. Best screenplay, screenplay. Um, was for Martin McDonough, the British Irish filmmaker who obviously created and and wrote the film for Colin Farrell, as we saw, and also the uh, the best picture for a musical or comedy as well. So they're kind of subdivided ca categories of this drama and musical or comedy. But look, it's a huge, a huge achievement, yeah. and obviously winning on on the treble is massive for was it in a film that is so obviously that Irish. they worked together on before? Was it fourteen years ago? Yeah, yeah. so yeah. that's what time. Colin Farrell referenced there because In Bruges was a classic movie as well, an yeah. absolute classic, and and like the the crucible for this relationship between the two of them like you know this fantastic romance as we said between Colin Farrell and Brendan Gleeson who are obviously actors of, of different generations but are kind of you know the foremost Irish actors of their day and obviously had this fantastic mm -hmm. chemistry on set which we first saw in In Bruges, which was also recognised back however many years ago, it was 14 years ago yeah. at the Golden Globes mm. in a similar way with Colin Farrell winning and Martin McDonough. So, you know, obviously now there's this fantastic relationship, fantastic working relationship and, and they're producing a great product as well. And it was, uh, of course, we are all looking towards the Oscars, but it was not mm. Kerry Condon, who was fantastic in the movie, as well as Barry Keoghan. They were up for awards. They didn't win, but they were 
wonderful. And I know kind of Kerry's going under the radar a little bit and she was really fantastic in that movie. So we're looking towards the Oscars yes. for that. And we're going to have a more in-depth look at all the fashion and style a little bit later on. Zendaya and Kate Blanchett. Very Keegan's suit is lovely. Barry Keoghan's suit was amazing. Himself yeah. and Seth Rogen looked like they should be in Dumb and Dumber together. I absolutely <laughs> I loved right. it. Austin Butler, the guy who played Elvis. Didn't he's he cool, look? Isn't he? He looks. So, we'll have all. We'll have all the to pictures. To be fair, for you a to be bit playing later. Elvis, there's a kind of baseline. You, kind of, you, you have to be. Cool, don't you have you? to be yeah, cool. But uh, listen, a, a good day for the Irish, and it's nice to start making the news yes. with a bit of good news yes. for a change. Before returning to the misery of the cost of living yes. crisis. <laughs> cost of living crisis. So pints of Guinness. Pints of everything Diageo own, which is an awful yeah. lot of drinks, uh, and also stamps are set to increase. Yeah, you forget about just how much Diageo own, because obviously it's not just Guinness, it's also things like Rockshore, Hop House 13, and you could go on. I think there's a there's Carlsberg, a stable there yes. of kind of five or six brands that you know would, would cover a lot of, of any bar counter, and they're going up by uh, by by 12 cent. Um, and you know what it, what I think is interesting is that like this is an addition on top of. Uh, an increase in the cost of pints that people have been seeing, I think, for a long time. And mm. I think a lot of people maybe who have been going out socialising over the Christmas would have seen, like, you know, they're paying a lot more than this time it's last year. And, pocket, yeah. and they're going to be hit again uh, early in the new year, not only on the, the cost of pints, which is perhaps something you can mitigate by going out for fewer, but on the, the cost of stamps, which are going up by 10 cents per stamp. Now, you can make this head on if you buy your stamps in bulk. They seem to be holding back some of the increases on, on the larger booklets. But I think, look, it's, it's an indication not only of the cost of living pressures that are coming home to roost for people, uh, you know, punters at home, but also for companies, because I think Ampost is one of those companies that has been trying to keep its costs where they were. But it looks like the level of cost increases that they're mm. facing across the board and their Fuel inputs. Fuel charges and for them there. alone, like they're exactly. on the road a lot, yeah. and it's going to be it's going to be significant. So now you're 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 seeing that kind of accelerated increase, and you know I think that you know it, it's it's a staple really, like it's a staple. I mean, you can argue whether pints are a staple or not, but certainly stamps. If you have a certain amount of posts that you have to send out every week, yeah. it's kind of unavoidable. You know, so it's an unavoidable cost of living See, increase. I suppose letters are things <clears> that people <throat> mightn't send anymore, but of course packages have just increased as yeah, to what they are doing. Yeah. So that's it. I wonder is it the end of the, the Christmas card and also the VAT increase in hospitality that's running out in February yes. so from 9% back up to 13% yes this is like so the forever war on. of yeah this is the forever war of Irish taxation policy it was 2020 when they reintroduced this um, lower rate of VAT for the hospitality sector having first introduced it during the recession and then fought for years and years and years to get it put back in the box so they brought it back in during Covid to try and give retailers a bit of a break and they've been trying to get it back ever since the Department of Finance hate it, yeah. the Commission on Taxation and Welfare hate it, everyone uh, within the kind of state overall dislikes it and everyone within the hospitality industry obviously loves it. Now on budget day it was very much flagged that this was going to be abolished at the end of February but when you look very closely at how then Minister for Finance Pascal Dunne worded it, he just he just said a statement of fact, which is it's due to expire at the end of February. Okay. That doesn't mean that he's necessarily definitely going to get rid of it. So you're seeing a rearguard action now at the last being fought by the vintners and by the hospitality oh, yeah. trade saying, please, now, not, not now. And they commissioned this study, uh, which says that there could be thousands of job losses if it goes wow. up. Six yeah, for a really pint it's hit yeah. after hit in that industry. Listen, let's finally just move on. Can we play on. a game show? Do you want to play it as a game show as you did earlier on? Oh, yes. Try and guess the yeah. department. Yeah. But Jack knows. Oh, he does know. Oh, I forgot. <laughs> I do, I don't, we did it I do, earlier on I don't on know, here. but I have it on a, on a piece of yes. paper here in front of me. So, so there are uh, 15 departments, obviously, yes. in the government, one of which women are paid higher. So Only four, one. 14 mm. um, men are uh, paid higher. And the one that women are paid higher in is in Department of Children. <laughs> yes. Which I'd say... I mean, that kind of sums it up, the reaction there, doesn't it? Yeah, Department of Children, which obviously is, is not just children. If you look at the, the length of the title of that department, it's about six or seven different yeah. things. Most notably, of course, the response to the refugee crisis, which has been front and centre okay. of the public policy space over the last year. But it is an interesting outcome uh, that 14 of 15 um, government departments uh, have a, a, a gender pay balance in favour of uh, of men, three point minus three point six percent of the Department of Children, as we said, which means it's weighted in favour of women, but going all the way up to uh, twenty point four percent in the Department of Transport. Now, what's interesting is when you look, when you drill into this, and when you look at some of the commentary around it, it seems that the public service actually does better than the private sector overall. Okay. And uh, what they're saying, or what the expert commentary is saying, is that when you have things like better flexible working practices, as tends to be the case in uh, government departments or in public sector bodies versus the private sector, when you have things like promotions which go through proper 
uh, transparency processes, when you have things like set salary scales, it does even out uh, the, the gender pay gap a little without going all the way. So it's almost as if when you control for things and make things more transparent and better structured, mm -hmm. Listen, it, it doesn't look good. Do as well. It yes. doesn't look good. And um, but we all know that women do leave work when families come along more so than men do. Yes. And when it comes to the Dep Department of Transport, 94% of the staff are men. 94% of the staff are men in, in relation mm. in regards to And apparently to a lot of them on kind of technical grades as well. So I don't know exactly how that shakes out, but apparently that has a big impact yeah. on why there's 20.4% uh, pay gap in favour of men. And what's interesting as well, they have some really interesting stats as well, um, is that a lot of the people who are wor working part-time positions are overwhelmingly women as well. And that impacts yeah. the, 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 the balance of the gender pay gap. So when you look at the, uh, the Department of Education, 252 of 264 part-time workers are women. So it's those kind of things and I suppose yeah. fundamentally addressing those kind of things and evening them out yeah. over a period of years, that's how you get to the bottom of the gender well, pay gap. You have to put this stuff out there for the changes to be made. If you don't know, then you don't know the size absolutely. or shape of the problem you're trying to solve. So. Yeah, it's lovely, but most women who are sitting down looking at their male colleague today know they're getting paid mess, less than them, whether you're in the private or public sector, casual that's work true. or not. That's just the way it is. Um, 0896 triple one triple one. we'd love to hear from you today. Jack Horgan Jones from the Irish Times, thank you so much. We'll have you back for the fashion slot uh, for the Golden Globes in just a little little while and still to come this hour we'll be discussing the current medicine shortage as people are urged not to stockpile. Plus we'll discuss the highs and lows of energy drinks. You don't want to miss that. See you shortly. It's great to have you back. Now, pharmacies across the country have been struggling with medicine shortages with more than 200 products now unavailable to patients in Ireland. Here to discuss the issue with us is pharmacist and member of the Irish Pharmacy Union, Cathy Maher. Cathy, it's lovely to have you with us. First of all, we, we do want to calm this. We don't want people freaking out and going out, as we were mentioning buying yesterday, toilet roll. buying toilet <laughs> rolls, stockpiling everything, going, I need all the cowpol and all the land. Absolutely, because we'd advise no stockpiling of any medicines. It's a medicine safety issue, first and foremost. Accidental poisoning is really common in young people and young children, so we don't want medicine stockpiled. And also, if it's stockpiled in one house, that means another house doesn't have access to it. So we want to make sure that there's equal distribution of medicines, both to pharmacy and then to patients' homes. So there's 200 products that are currently on shortage at the minute. Are there any that are, you should be concerned about? You know, Calpol parents obviously need to maybe have Calpol in the house. I know we, we have it, but... Like when you're talking blood pressure tablets, certain painkillers. Yeah, they're, they're, it's been intermittent. Medicine shortages isn't a new problem. It's been going on okay. for a number of years. It has certainly worsened in the past 12 months and certainly with the increased incidence of respiratory illness, it has intensified in the past maybe six weeks, eight weeks, as we've seen, and has become very, very, very topical. Um, Paracetamol-based products, certainly like Calpol, um, prescription packs of paracetamol have been intermittent in supply so we're trying to manage that as best we can but what we'd say to anyone is if there's any query pick up the phone speak to your pharmacist we can talk you through what the next steps are if it's your medicine for long-term condition like blood pressure or like an antidepressant or something else whatever is in short supply we talk through what's the next step if it's something that's for an acute illness like um, an antibiotic for a bacterial mm. infection then what we need to do is get that switched to something appropriate to start prompt treatment and that's where we can play a key role as well. So an alternative, mm -hmm. okay. So, right, in Ireland, because when you go to a lot of other European countries, we know that you can often go in and get something that you just cannot get here unless you've got a prescription. Pharmacists are the first line of defence. We all know that people go in and go, I'm feel not feeling great and that's where you are. Do we need to empower pharmacists more because you have the knowledge rather than everyone going straight to their GP spending a fortune when they could just, like there's more that you could do? There's, there's a huge amount we can do and we would call on government to look at expanding the role of what we can do as a healthcare profession. There's so much that we can offer and we are the most accessible healthcare profession. Our doors are always open. We're there long hours. I'll be in work till seven or eight tonight to kind of make sure that my, my community is well served. But there's loads we can do. In terms of medicine shortages, what we would really love to do is actually use our clinical expertise. We are, as a profession, the medicines experts. So if something's in short supply, usually we switch to a genetic, you know, the, in between brands of the same medicine. If that molecule, that actual drug, can't be sourced at all, then what we need to do is have something like a serious shortage protocol. And we've mentioned it before in terms of I can then switch to the next safest therapeutic alternative. And what that does is allow for prompt effective treatment for patients. If it's an antibiotic for bacterial infection, 
I don't want to have to delay that treatment by three or four hours or 24 hours if it's a night of hours. It takes time to get back to the prescriber to get something switched. So so what, why are they not doing this? When we're seeing hospitals overcrowded, we're hearing GPs, and this isn't a new thing, this is all year long GPs saying they're overcrowded, they can't see everybody. Mm. Why is Stephen Donnelly in the Department of Health not making this change when it, you make it sound like it should be something routine, something very simple and makes common sense? On the ground, we're all working really hard. We've got medicine distributors, the wholesalers, there's two main line wholesalers in Ireland. We've got the medicines regulator, the HPRA. We're all trying to work to see that we can have equal distribution of medicines, but we do need the government to look at a serious shortage Why don't protocol. they do it, though? It's a matter of time, I'd imagine. Like, I'd like to see it happen earlier rather than later. You might cast your mind back to last spring when there was an acute shortage of HRT products. Yeah. Yes. And that was causing real distress for women and, you know, it's a debilitating, you know, real distress mm -hmm. for them. And if I had a serious shortage of protocol in place back then, I could very easily have switched a woman from a patch to a gel, to a gel, to a, back to a patch, to a tablet, without the need to refer back to a prescriber Because those things time. were available. They're right there. They're behind your counter. And we could do dose equivalent. We knew what was effective and safe. But each time there's a shortage, I'd have to go back to prescriber. What's the qualms that stop them doing it, though? There is must legislative be a reason. requirement. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There, there is, and we're working with the department to try and get that in place. I'd like to see it in earlier rather than later. But in terms of the acute problem at the minute in respiratory illness, we are asking people, yeah. call your pharmacy. We will talk you through what you can manage at home, what you need to see the GP about, and what you need to go to A&E about. OK, so that's the thing. You can be like before you go to these places that you might be waiting, not be able to mm -hmm. get seen, you might be sitting there for hours, come to us. This is... This seri serious shortage protocol is something that is working in other countries. It's something that other pharmacists do. We have spoken here to pharmacists before who were like, oh, if GPs, and being really nice about it, but just being like, if GPs could put down two or three things just in case we don't have it. Is there communication between, we'll say, the GPs and pharmacists? Like, yeah, are you work, chatting, going, lads, can you give us, can you help us out here? We work really well together on the grind, the grind. There's an excellent working relationship between pharmacists and GPs because all of us have the ultimate outcome as a good patient outcome. That's what we want. Um, but I'm contacting GPs dozens and dozens of times a day in terms of other clinical interventions that I do as part of my job. I don't want to be calling a GP every time something's in short supply mm. and a GP doesn't need me contacting them every time something's in short supply. So what we need to do is put something like this in place to actually use our skill. We're the medicines experts. If I ring the prescriber to say, I can't get product A, they'll say, what would you recommend? So if I'm doing it anyway, we just need the legislative department piece of the piece of paper, the prescription piece to move and allow me switch. I've heard so many pharmacists on the radio yeah. and television talk about this over the last few weeks. I just boggles my mind why something like this hasn't happened yet. Yeah. And you're the medicines um, experts. Absolutely. Like you're the ones yeah. who have all the knowledge. Um, uh, Kathy, <laughs> Kathy Maher, a pharmacist and uh, chair in the IPU uh, Contractors Committee. Thank you so much for okay. coming in this morning to talk to us. Sure. Seven o'clock. That's where she's going to be working until seven o'clock telling you what yeah, to do. Well. Absolutely. Okay. Now for this morning's poll right here in Ireland there. We want to hear your thoughts on this. Have you had any difficulty getting medicine recently regardless of what sort of medicine it was whether it was something that you can just go and get from the pharmacy like Calpol? Are you yeah. okay with Calpol? Oh yeah. We've Are you got okay? Calpol. You've well, got Calpol. Run a bit short. Uh, get the phone out, uh, put, hold it over the little QR code over there to cast your vote uh, we would love to hear yes or no please do get in touch as well 0896 111 we'd love to hear from you. Now it's almost time for a break. Alan, what's coming up next? Coming up next, I, I couldn't get a cough bottle in a certain chemist, a certain brand of cough bottle. There gone. Go. Just Expect gone. to another chemist to get it, yeah. yeah. Another pharmacy to get it. That's, that, that's what we're facing at the moment. Now, the energy drink market is booming and we find out what ingredients are in each of these brands and look at the amount of sugar that is in each of them. We're going to be discussing this after the break. There's been huge hype surrounding a new energy drink available in the US and UK. And you might not have seen it, but the kids will definitely have seen the videos around it. Yeah, they certainly will. It's not available in Ireland as yet, but uh, you can see there are many other brands that are available in Ireland. And uh, dietitian Louise Reynolds is here to explain the ingredients and the sugar content of each. Good morning to you, Louise. Good morning, Alan. Let's start about this new, it's called Prime. Yes. So that's tell right. us about this and why are people going mad here to, to get it? I know, I know. Well, I think it is 
really it's the YouTuber's influence. It's the influencer marketing and the hype that's been created around this product. So as you said, it's not available in Ireland at the moment. Um, and whether it is or not, I had a look on their website and really it is just another type of energy drink. They have two varieties. They have a hydration one, which doesn't have caffeine. They have an energy one. That's often the energy drinks suggest that there's caffeine in there as well as the sugar. Well, people so, are queuing in supermarkets for these. It's chaos. Yeah. Chaos. Yeah. Oh, that's, yeah. I know. Yeah. And I've seen people buying them for €2 Euro and then reselling it for €20 Euro, you know, outside the shop 10 minutes later. But that's just the let's, marketing yeah, Let's get the into hype. these energy drinks, though, because yeah. there is, like, I know that Monster Energy is part owned by Coca-Cola and, like, the sales for it is astronomical. Yeah, we they, know how huge the likes of Red Bull and Lucas A, whatever. Yeah. We see kids. Is it mainly young kids? Because I see a lot of them with their school uniforms drinking, drinking these, these yeah. drinks. Now, if you look closely at all of them, they say not suitable for under 16 years of age. Um, however, they are being sold to, and it's the teenage boys in particular, mm -hmm. um, who, because of the marketing behind a lot of these products, they tend to be linked with the extreme sports. You know, they, the brands promote <coughs> um, surfing competitions yeah. or, you know, so they're, they're, they're seen as really cool, mm. something to aspire to. Well then, but, so can I just ask you then, Louis, yeah. sorry for interrupting you there. Is it up to the supermarket then not to sell it to people? Should you be asked for, for ID? Well, a number of years ago, a couple of the stores did bring in sort of self-regulation and they were saying that they weren't going to sell them. But again, that's quite a difficult thing to police because if you have a 15-year-old boy working working at, on a Saturday afternoon in his local shop and other 14-year-olds come in to buy them, he's not going to, you know, ask for ID. So um, it's, it is, the, it says they're not suitable, but they are being sold to, but, to youngsters. Because there's a huge amount of sugar. We can see the sugar cubes yeah, here yeah. and also caffeine. Yes, it's the caffeine that really differentiates them from just a sugary drink. And we all know that sugary drinks aren't a great idea from a dental health point of view, your overall imbalance in your diet, um, and of course, then, you know, linked with conditions such as obesity, if you're not active and you're relying too much on sugary drinks. But it's the caffeine in these that also makes them stand out. And that's really why they're not suitable for children. Also, it says for pregnant women, women who are breastfeeding. So because, you are getting your caffeine rush from Yeah, them. absolutely. And it varies between about 60 or 70 milligrams of caffeine per container. Again, they're quite, some of them are what quite large. What would that be equal to, say, a cup of coffee? It's about one kind of strong cup of coffee. So, you okay. know, a kind of an espresso or an Americano that be about 70 to 80 milligrams of caffeine and some of these have up to 160 so it's like getting two shots of coffee as well as all of the sugar so you certainly are not <laughs> going to give you know, a nice yeah, go, yeah, yeah, yeah can exactly. we just look at them I mean we're just looking at this wood that has the most sugar content yeah, and there's about this... 70 grams of sugar in, in this, that, yeah, 70 grams. Now, 70 grams. what kind of sugar should we be taking into our body every day? We certainly well, shouldn't be taking that amount. No, that's about, about 21. 20 21. Really <laughs> there, yeah. I'm very glad so, you did yeah, that yeah, for me. About 21. 21, uh, 21. cubes yeah. of sugar. Yeah, Goodness. exactly. And the, the WHO have recommended that, you know, we shouldn't be getting... That's, this is free sugars. So this is not the same as sugar that comes in, you know, the sugar that's found naturally occurring in fruit or that's naturally occurring in milk or yogurts. That's not the same in terms of how our body metabolizes it. These are free sugars and we do need to limit them and the World Health Organization say we shouldn't be having more than about the equivalent of six teaspoons of sugar in the whole day of free sugars. So that would be if you have a bit of jam on your toast or if you have a bit of honey okay, or fruit juice, they like would that. all be free sugars. Um, yeah. But from one can of this you can see you're getting 21. what did I say? 21. Uh, 20, yeah, 21. so that's about if you, almost If you're four a parent times. and you see yeah. your children drinking these. You need and to have a conversation. Well you've had the conversation with them they yeah. they love it. Well, is me, a sugar-free uh, option a better option? Well, or it's still, still... the caffeine, so no, I don't think for teenagers. Now, again, if you're somebody who's watching this and if you're in your 30s and you're working late and you feel you're getting, you know, a boost from the caffeine, they're on sale, there is a market for them. My concern is, is for the youngsters teenagers, buying teenagers. Yeah. And again, I had all of these on the kitchen table last night and I have a 17-year-old son at home and his eyes lit up when they yeah. came into the kitchen. You know, his mother, the dietitian, with all the energy drinks and he said, like, are they for me? I was like, but no, I mean, no. Like, <laughs> they're not, no. Like, you're saying have a conversation with your child, but, I mean, you shouldn't have to have a conversation with your child. You should just tell them these are banned, you can't have them, yeah. surely. So yeah. they're in school, they could just name oh, them. Oh, I know, but money. I mean... But that's like... the thing, they have pocket money, you know, so these are the kind of things that, you know, teenage boys with pocket money go into the shop with their friends. So, you know, just be aware, <clears throat> dentists don't like them because of all the sugar, obviously. The caffeine is not something that we recommend for children. Children's bodies are, you know, smaller. They don't need caffeine. Caffeine is a stimulant. Um, and the more you have of it as well, you can develop a threshold almost to caffeine, so then you need more to get the same amount buzz. of a buzz. And again, older people are, you know, kind of the young 
in their young uh, 20s or late teens are mixing these with alcohol as well. And that leads to other issues because the stimulant effect of the caffeine keeps you going for longer at night time, therefore you're drinking more, you more drink risky behaviours and so okay. on. So, you know, again, that's not something which is really, you know, they're not marketed as that mm -hmm. um, to be used in that way, but they are being used in that way. It's incredible it's, to see how yeah. unhealthy that you're telling us they are between the amount of sugar, the amount of caffeine, caffeine. but the power of marketing. Of marketing. It really is and the power of marketing. And them being linked to motocross and surfing and yeah. these well, extreme it's, sports it's, it's, and exactly. everything. Exactly. And, yeah. and, and kind of incredible. cliff diving and yeah. all of the, which are really exciting sports yeah, and the you. adrenaline rush, you know, that you kind of would get even from watching these, never mind competing in them. So I think, look, just to be aware, they're not suited for under 16s. They all say it in really small print. I have yeah, to get my glasses course. out to see it. Yeah. But they all say it on the container. So just So if you're be under aware, 16, they're... you should not be drinking no. any of these. And no. it should be up to the supermarkets and shops to police that also. Yeah. Yeah. Louise Reynolds, Louise, thank uh, dietitian, much. thank you so much for this. Thank if you. you have children who do love getting stuck into them, you have an issue with them, 0896 111 we'd love to hear from you. And now, still to come, broadcaster Mary Kennedy is going to be here. She's going to talk about retirement and lots of new opportunities. Plus, we have a healthy breakfast option from this to a healthy breakfast option in the kitchen. Stay tuned. See you in a few minutes. <laughs> thank you. Welcome back. There's lots more still to come between now and 10 a.m. He drank every single energy drink. He's good to go. Oh, yeah, I practiced. No, it did not. They're very bad for very you. Very bad for I you. I just drink coffee. Legendary Irish broadcaster Mary Kennedy talks retirement, new beginnings, and her love of the West of Ireland. Lovely. He's one of the most influential GPs in the UK. Dr. Rang Rangan Chatterjee helps us get healthy and transform our lifestyle after. He's got a lot to do in 10 minutes he's after 9 o'clock. He's going to transform us, guys. He's going to need the monster energy in him. Plus, we get one wedding blogger's top tips for newly engaged. You wouldn't be saying you're newly engaged, but this engaged ring, for years. the sparkle off it every morning. Uh, Warren's going to have the notepad out. But he comes in, he's like, let me try it on. He tries it on every morning, guys. Uh, now, we've got a breakfast staple, even though these two are fighting over whether it's a breakfast staple or no, not. It's, not. it's definitely not a breakfast staple. <laughs> but we're arguing, is it a healthy breakfast? Is it a healthy breakfast? Breakfast muffin. It is. It is. If you vary it, like, I'm going to give you variations for it. OK. okay. Now, tell, tell our viewers what you're making. I'm making breakfast muffins. <laughs> but what's in it? Oh, marmalade. How is marmalade healthy? No, I'm using the sugar free. <laughs> <laughs> no added sugar. No sugar. No That's added a, sugar. There's no butter and no sugar. Oh, there is butter now, but you can all, you can you can eat the butter. Alan, for she all. asked you not to do this. Oh, this is typical. He's so mean. The, the two of them He's have been so there. Mean. It is healthy. It isn't healthy. It is healthy. It isn't healthy. <laughs> Like that for the last what are we like? Oh, no. Well, we're making muffins anyway. Whether they're healthy or not is up for discussion. <laughs> we'll discuss it when we're we'll making them. We'll discuss it later <laughs> on. Uh, they look delicious, though. Now, we're hoping Derek hasn't been uh, too blown away. Where You're in leak slip this morning, Derek. Do you know what? I'll tell Catherine to send those breakfast muffins our way. We love marmalade. Whatever you're having, whatever you're throwing in, Catherine, we'll eat it. Anyway, uh, I'll still wet, still quite windy out there this morning, a risk of thunderstorm activity and a risk of hail out there today. But guys, how good did the Banshees of Inish here do with the Golden Globes? We're delighted. you know what it was? It was the copying and the iron sweater. Do you remember that interview we did? <laughs> That's what did the trick for them. <laughs> Delighted for them. That's, that's definitely what got definitely, them over the yeah. line. All right. He was also, channeling yeah. that last night. He was like, remember that interview I yeah. did with Derek and Ireland AM? That's it. Brendan Gleeson, thank you so much. <laughs> Derek. Derek. <laughs> Time now to take a look at this morning's papers. We'll start with the Irish Times. It's headline, walk-in flu vaccines to be offered to children as cases soar. Walk-in flu vaccination clinics are being offered to children from this week as the HSE said nearly 700 under 14s have been hospitalised with the illness this winter. The examiner also leads with clinics offer flu vaccines for children. Well, patients are stuck in hospital for over six months. That's the first page, uh, front page of the Irish Independent. The paper reports some patients who no longer need to be in overcrowded hospitals are languishing in wards for more than six months because of a lack of suitable step-down care. State pays road toll firms 30 million in compensation is the top story of the Daily Mail. The state spent millions of taxpayers' money compensating toll operators after traffic died during the pandemic, but it did not have to do so, the spending watchdog has said. The mirror goes with bravest boy, Alejandro Mazan, aged nine, who suffered horrific facial industries when he was savagely mauled by a pit bull, has returned home to his family in Enniscorthy after seven weeks in hospital. The Sun also leads with that story. I'm so happy to be home. The Star's front page, 
Quirk's ex on death drive charge. The <coughs> ex of murderer Patrick Quirk, who killed Mr Moonlight DJ Bobby Ryan, has been charged with careless driving causing death. And the Herald goes with US actor stalked Irish doc for 19 years. An American actor accused of stalking an Irish doctor was romantically obsessed with her after they had a brief sort of relationship 19 years ago. A court heard that yesterday. And he just showed up in Ireland this Wild. Christmas to her house. It's yeah, mad. It's mad isn't it? um, talking about the medicines shortages, so yes. 200 different types of medication or whatever products are short in pharmacies. And a lot of people, we asked people out there, are you, have you been in this situation? Yeah. Have you gone to the pharmacy and not been able to get it? Get out your phone, give us a, a yes or no on the QR Scan code, the please code. let us know. Um, a lot of texts are in as well about it. Um, yeah, yeah, Valerie, like I couldn't get a cough bottle in one pharmacy the other day. I had to go to a separate pharmacy to get a certain uh, cough medicine. And Valerie saying, I work in a pharmacy in County Cork. The shortages are crazy at the moment. We can't get cough bottles. Antibiotics are short and there's a restricted supply on a lot of medicines. I've worked in the pharmacy industry for 26 years and I have never seen it this bad. Oh, wow, wow, right. And Leanne, I'm struggling to get my diabetes medication, which is very frightening. Yeah, you... I've got enough for one more week, then I don't know what I'll do. That... Surely... What? Well, I think if what you do, there definitely will be products somewhere. I think if you ring a pharmacy and it's an emergency, like they, they will would be have able it. to well, find have it, to it somewhere. Get it somewhere they too, obviously yeah. have to decide who gets it. So these sort of things. Uh, Michelle said, so I have a difficulty getting eye drops for my son's conjunctivitis. I've had to refer back to the GP and it took four days to sort. It's an absolute nonsense. I think we were talking to Cathy, one of the pharmacists earlier as well, yeah. is that there's different products. So if you can't get, say, the, the diabetes tablets, that you're maybe normally prescribed. There's, there'll be an alternative. A pharmacist probably can give you an alternative yeah. medication. And they're allowed we'll do to the do job. that at they're, the moment. Well, yeah. they're not allowed no, to do but that. I, but I thought they were going to be allowed to no, do that. No, so they're calling for Kathy right. has said that she will be on the phone today. She's working until 7 o'clock tonight. She'll be on the phone today or with, uh, and emails at least to a G, two GPs about 30 times, at least. And she said the GPs are right. fantastic. To say, to say we don't have, we don't this. have this, can I prescribe yeah. this? But then they've, got asking... a, then they've got to email through a new prescription. And so they're, they're asking, asking the government to like let them like we're we're experts in this. No, let us do yeah. this. I mean, it makes no sense that they're not. We need the legislation. We have to talk with the energy drinks. Oh yeah, we were well. talking so about the amount of sugars. What was it? Twenty-one, 21 ice, uh, sugar, sugar cubes yeah. in one of these energy drinks. Insane. And there's caffeine on top of that. And so many young children, teenagers are drinking yeah. these drinks. But we did say there is a warning on each of the labels uh, not to be sold to under 16s. And I was saying earlier on that maybe the shop owners should have some responsibility. And Yvette says, as a shop owner, I have on many occasions politely mentioned to parents that their kids were too young for these drinks. I'm too polite to tell you what they said to me in return. One lady, one lady poured the energy drink into a baby bottle in front of me. I blame the parents, they won't say no. Pardon I'm sure a lot, there's a lot the of bottle. responsible parents, but if a parent is taking out an energy drink and pouring it into a baby's bottle... My goodness. You know the way we're always like, oh, the judgement of parents when children are having breakdowns. Yeah, you can judge a parent <laughs> for putting an energy drink into do a baby's get, bottle. Do get in touch with the QR code, but also <clears> send <throat> us in your texts on this if you have a similar story to that. No, wait, nine. Nine. Six, triple one, triple one. Thank there you. you go. I'm so used to saying it. Now, coming up next, Mary Kennedy is going to be here. We're not going to mention her nephew once. That's that's a promise, right? You've just done it. I just, just did it. it. We'll talk yeah. to you in a second. Now, our next guest is one of the most recognisable faces on Irish television. Oh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> and even after supposedly hanging off her broadcasting boots, she's busier than ever. Good morning, Mary Kennedy. How are you doing? Happy New Year to you both. It's lovely Great to be to here. It's you lovely to have you. Up early, said don't that. you guys? It's, it was so funny because we talk, we've mentioned numerous times the retirement, but it's very much in inverted commas because you're working all the time. Not all the time. No, no. I, it's lovely to be able to do um, pet projects, things that are really, I suppose, meaningful for me. And they're, you know, the, the programme now that's starting tonight on TG Car, it's not a million miles from the kind of uh, things that I was doing on Nationwide because you're meeting people, you're finding out about their lives and you're, you're, you're kind of being welcomed into their homes. And that's, that I love. I love meeting people. I love being in people's houses. <laughs> <laughs> I love going to the, the, the country oh, and the coast and things, and it's all based along the West Coast, so it's lovely. It's just, it's flexibility, really, isn't it? Yeah. To be able to 
Do you know, Tommy, I think there are very definite stages in life. And okay. there is a stage where, you know, you're, you're finding yourself, where you're cementing your career, where you're maybe having a family. And then you come to this stage, which, which is where I am, where you realise that the important thing really is the relationships that you have and the time that you have to spend with people, with loved ones. And we have learned during COVID that when that is taken from you, it has a massive impact on your well-being. So I don't want to be at this stage in my life and say, oh, I can't, I can't go down to Limerick to see my grandchildren because I'm too busy. So it's about pacing and yeah. choosing and... Do you think, uh, now looking back on that though, Nowadays, and we're talking to Rangan Chatterjee later on, yeah. who's got this health podcast, and he's all about relationships as well, mm. but that people are constantly chasing nowadays. You know, everybody has to work harder, everybody's trying to chase the dream, whatever else, and we give up on those relationships a little bit. I, I think, think there's a stage in your life where you, you put them on the back burner, and I think that's regrettable. Um, mm. And I, I do feel that, uh, I hope that uh, as a result of COVID, we have taken more of a, a judgmental eye on that, and that we're more uh, selective about yeah. what we do, where our priorities are, that we say, no, this relationship is important, this friendship is important, this friend needs me now. Now. So, um, you know, uh, I, I mean, like, people kind of chase career and they chase wealth and they chase success. Mm -hmm. And really, what is success at the end of the day? It's about being happy yeah. and having a good life and work balance, which is what this series, Moving West, is really all about, work-life balance. Oh, look how she did that there. She got <laughs> it in. She came back Amazing. around. Because that's, it's, on it's on TG Carr. It's on TG Carr. This is the second series yeah. of it. It was uh, on last year as well, and it went down, it was very well received by the, the audience, so TG Carr very kindly commissioned it again. And, you know, this, it's, it's, it's quite a diverse selection of people that we meet it's um like there's there's french diplomat who's married to an american publisher who has decided to to live on aaron moore island off donegal look at the coastline i mean we, we should be very proud of what we have and you do get i mean i i felt a little sense of pride when when these people um would say yeah we've chosen to live here um, because of the sense of community, yeah. because of the work-life balance, because of the, the way our children, you know, can have a, a very free life mm. in, in the community. Yeah, yeah, it's lovely. And you yourself, as you were kind of going through all of this, uh, Moving West, and it's great, you know, because it's a bilingual programme, you're talking to an awful lot of people who, who are, so it's really gorgeous, oh, and yeah. it always has been. But you yourself, you, were, you moved house. I did, yes, at the end of September, yeah. Three months. <laughs> Three months? She's in her new gaff. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I didn't move very far. I love where See, I, I live. I love the, the community. No. <laughs> Oh, all right, okay. Tommy, I moved a half a kilometre from my old house. <laughs> I thought you were interviewing your neighbours <laughs> as part of the show. No, 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 no. Uh, no, it's just, again, got to that stage in life that, I, uh, that I've described to you where uh, my house, my, my children are grown up. The house was very big. The garden was huge. I love gardening. Yes. So I didn't want to get to a stage where it was beyond me, as they say. So yeah, I've embraced this change and I love it. Dara, uh, Dara O'Brien, the Minister for Housing, will be rolling you out now going, look, downsizing, oh, yeah. downsizing. <laughs> Mary Kennedy did it. Absolutely. We can all do it. Give is, up the is it hard, though, to say goodbye to a house mm. that has such memories and history? You know, you were in there, I don't know how many years. 20 years. Wow. Yeah, well, actually, what was, they say it's very stressful to move house and it, it, it is. But but it's the anticipation of the actual move. Mm. And it's right up to the day that you move. But once that actually happened, and uh, I woke up in this new house, which again is very close to where I was. I have the same friends, the same okay. neighbors more or less, and new, lovely new young neighbors. Um, I just said, no, this is right. You know, you yeah. have to embrace change. And I, mm -hmm. I you know, yes. Yeah, so. Then is there that question, though, you know, when you're happy in yourself, you've been doing, you know, living by yourself for years, the kids come and go do what they want to do, but the question of, does the fella move in? Did you have to have, did you have, to have that conversation of going, I'm buying my own house, bye, see you later? No, 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 no. I mean, I think it's nice. I, I have my own sense of identity, so does my partner, and it's nice to have um, our own place and then to come together as well. It's nice to have it separate. Is it, oh, it's a bit yeah. of expectancy yeah. that... 
to, to move in together, is it? No, no. Did you have to have the serious not conversation? Like you're not you're invite. far too young to understand. You can do whatever you want. <laughs> what do you like in terms? Are you ruthless in terms of getting rid of stuff? I wasn't, Would but I am now. But yeah, to I am Mary Kondo. Does this spark joy? Nope. God. Did you? <laughs> you had to. Yeah. What, was it? Was I did it? offer my children lots of uh, the kind of memorabilia, <laughs> but they were very reluctant to accept it. So. <laughs> who, who took stuff? Uh, well, some of them would have a sentimental attachment to one or two things, but yeah, they, it was nice. They're but... top of the list. They're top of the list. <laughs> um, as you mentioned there, you've got because you had you had Christmas again this year. You had everyone was Thank kind goodness. of home, weren't they? And you've got three gr grandchildren yes. now. Yeah. Paddy, Holly and Julia. And Julia's 10 weeks old. She's 10, 10 weeks old. She's probably 11 now. She was 10 weeks at Christmas, yeah. Uh, it Fabulous. was lovely. Yeah, it was lovely because um, my the way we do Christmas in our family, which is the way we did it as, as children as well, myself and my brother and his wife, we alternate. And that all went haywire yeah. over COVID. So um, we were able to resume this year. It was my turn to host. So it was very nice. And to have it in the new house was, was good as well. It was chaos. <laughs> But everybody, you know, yeah. walked in. And it, there's something special with the kids as well. I think Paddy isn't he like three and a half, so he's probably really getting so excited oh, yeah, about the whole yeah. thing as well. He got the remote um, control fire truck, not oh. to be confused with the remote control fire engine, Tommy. Oh, I don't know so the different. difference, oh, but oh, so listen, different. I know there all about my house. Do you? Okay. Oh, I yeah, do. Damn it. Um, <laughs> you were, yeah, you were. Well, you put up pictures over but, Instagram that I um, absolutely loved, and it was your, uh, it was a, the retirement party in RT, and everyone was there, and it looked very glam, and it was lovely. And oh, then that I was on the anniversary of it. The anniversary of of you kind of going, bye. Uh, and then I was reading something interesting yourself and Marty Whelan, there he is, he emceed the event. Oh, that's right. When you co-hosted together, yeah. You people look very cosy together People used there, to think you? that you were a couple. Oh, absolutely, yeah. What? Yeah, yeah. They when did. you did Open House? We did, and it was, uh, and there's Eileen. Eileen has recently Eileen's retired, retired as well. As well yeah. and, and loving it, same as myself. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah uh, people did, you know, and we used to, um, I mean, I'm very friendly with Marty and Maria, and they are the best fun. They're really close friends of mine. But yeah, we used to say every so often, if something you'd be doing something, and say, "Oh, this one's for the woman in the coach house," because there was this, there was this <laughs> woman having coffee in the coach house, and Maria, Marty's wife, was there years and years and years ago. And uh, they were herself and her friend were talking about, "Oh, there's definitely something going on between the two of them." <laughs> Mad, oh, I know, but yeah. It's great the way the rumours go. I love it. Like that. That. I've never oh, realised that. Before. Up here again now. Listen to Mary, a new show, Moving West, is back on season two. It's on tonight. Mm -hmm. Is it Wednesdays on TG Car? Yes. And as, as, as Maureen said, it's bilingual. A lot of the people are interviewed in English. And when it's Oscar, there are subtitles. And we should be very proud of our language Absolutely. and using it and hearing it because it's the most beautiful language in the world. Absolutely. Good on you. Amazing. She, she can work with Light the department, the department of Education with the Irish and the tourism. Department of Housing with the, with the, and the Tourism. <laughs> My God, she's hitting it off. It's great to have you with us, Mary. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. Thank you very much. Thanks for staying with us. Now, breakfast is the most important meal of the day. So, so, excuse me. So you need to start it with a muffin. Yeah, so... I know, all, go on. We're down. all about yeah. healthy, healthy eating this morning, Catherine Layden. Yeah, he's, he's giving you an awful hard time. He's actually eating me now. You sure they won't be burnt the ones in the oven? Merciful Lord, you couldn't deal with them, could you? No. Um, the muffins, these are quite healthy, actually. Yeah, breakfast muffins. Breakfast muffins. Breakfast muffins. Marmalade in them. But you don't taste the marmalade as such. You get the orange no, flavour. No, it's gorgeous, I know yeah. you have. Now, so to make it, we put 125 grams, four ounces of our coarse whole meal into the bowl, and that's high in fibre. So right, keep you get the fibre in. Exactly. 125 <laughs> grams, four ounces of... Tommy's onto his third so one. You, plain so you've already had one. I'm going to have one now. <laughs> you've had one already. <laughs> <laughs> He'd hang us all out to dry, wouldn't he, that fellow? Would, Catherine. And then to Careful. that, we add a teaspoonful which is the same amount above the rim of the spoon as beneath it, teaspoonful of baking powder. So all the dry ingredients into the mixing bowl for starters. And here I have just the rind of an orange. Now, the liquid ingredients are as follows. Four ounces of butter melted and allow it to cool, OK? If you wish, you can replace the four ounces of butter with four tablespoonfuls of oil. Sunflower oil. And that would be more healthy, would it? A bit healthier, yes. OK. Yeah, it would. Get the now, butter in. to that we're going to add, it's cooled down, <laughs> as we say. We're going to add one egg. We're going to add 150 ml, a quarter pint of milk. And we're going to add two, tea two tablespoonfuls of honey. This is what sweetens them. OK. OK. And a tip I've probably given before, dip the spoon into boiling water before you start. Yeah. And... 
I the syrup or honey that. with it the axe. It runs off. It won't. It won't stick. Stick is. I've been doing that, trying to put honey in my porridge, a and it's a disaster. Golden syrup, treacle, <laughs> the same thing. Trying to get it out of the hot jar. Water. Hot water. Hot on total the sense. Water. Total yep. sense. Yeah. And then to that, we're going to add the no sugar added marmalade. Mm, two okay. tablespoons. Okay. There you go now. Two tablespoons. Yep. Okay. Okay, so that I just adds I a nice little yeah. bit of flavour to it. It does. Yeah. Now, if you want to vary it, you could replace the. Um, the orange with lemon, lemon curd, okay, and yeah. the rind of a lemon, OK? Yeah. But, of course, you're far more sugar in it, that's the case. Far more what? And there's far more sugar in the lemon curd. I'm sorry, very much. <laughs> sorry, sorry, can't hear you over that, Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> so now we're just combining <laughs> the liquid ingredients, and now we just add them <clears throat> to the dry ingredients. Now, it helps if you just mix the two flours together, and the orange rind. Now we pour this liquid in and you're going to get quite a wet mixture. Now with a muffin, you never beat, you just gently stir until the flour is combined. Yeah, because you were pouring some in that you were making earlier and it was quite, we thought it was wrong because it was quite lumpy and wet. See, not wrong. No, obviously not. And a tip, but... if you go to try to spoon this, now you see, I'll just hold some up now that you see what it looks like. A very, very oh, wet very... mixture. Yeah. Now, if you try to spoon that into the um, bun cases, yeah. you'd, have un you'd have an unholy mess on your hands and you'd be trying to clean around the paper cases. So if people I are do... making this, don't worry if it's, you think it's... Oh, no, you that's know, you get people might be sort of saying, oh, we need to add more flour or no, something no. like that. It's too thick this or too it's too thick. watery. Too thick is right. Too thick and too watery. And too watery. So tip for you to fill the paper cases, the muffin cases, transfer the dough from the bowl into the jug you use for the liquid ingredients. I believe the less washing up, the better. Yeah. And now we just pour it into the muffin cases. Yeah. About two thirds of the way up. And these are baked at um, 275, 375, 170, gas mark four, for about 20 minutes. And 20 minutes ago, you put we some put in. some in there, yep, that so you were you worried about. Take them out, take them take out, them out there, Alan. Yep. I'll take them out. Take them out for me, great. Yep. Yep. Come on out. Now, you see... Oh, they're brown. They're burning a little. And I'll, I'll give you a burning. <laughs> Do you hear that, Tommy? How many of these would be acceptable to have in the morning, Catherine, now? I, <laughs> I see. <laughs> I, oh, perfect. Yeah. How, yeah, exactly, Catherine. For a healthy breakfast, one. how many would you say? One. One? one. one. Yep. Yeah, I wanted to have a nice warm one. They, yeah, yeah oh, you want yeah. to get a hot one now. But there, it would be nice even, would you put them like in the little school bag for the kids? Perfect be for perfect lunches perfect as well. For perfect lunch, for yeah. lunches, yeah. yeah. Now, it does help if you get a little bit of the dribbles on, as I did there, to just remove it before it goes into the oven because that would just burn into the tin. Oh, yeah. And extra work for you cleaning afterwards. And you Look see, there's no trouble at all if you just use the jug. Well, I have to tell you, I had there a cold go. one there and they were... Delicious. Yeah, John, now, you're going to have a nice warm one, one, one here now. And nice then ruin the diet by putting butter on it. Oh, yeah, well, butter. <laughs> yeah, but see, you have this. Now, you've butter and jam here. That's defeating the purpose a bit, is it? Well, yeah. just for you to taste it. There's marmalade if you want it. Oh, I love it. Love yeah. her. Go on. No, go on. So we have one there. warm one there Take each. Take a hot one each now. OK, Catherine. And how long were they in the oven for again? 20 minutes. Oh, 20 minutes. Yeah. That's it. Catherine Layden, as always, not the park. Thank you so much for Absolutely that. Absolutely gorgeous. Oh, that's delicious. That's so warm as well. Yeah. Now, coming up next, uh, Warren's outside chatting to Sarah all morning. She's getting top tips for newly engaged <laughs> couples <laughs> on where to she's start. She's writing down. Murren has an, a, an iPad and she's typing yeah, everything in. It's all books. Oh, yeah. Uh, Just did it. Everything's Wedding done. planning, have you got it coming up? Uh, don't go anywhere. We've got everything for you next. We're having conniptions here over how much we, we should be spending on, on wedding presents. And I'm like, maybe I will get married after all. If you're in the money, you might get married again. Uh, with December being the most common monster in game, <laughs> it's likely that many of you at home are in the midst of booking your big day. He's going to redo his vows, Alan. He'll get, redo his get vows. Get the envelopes ready. You're going to quiz in. That's Thank it. You. Sarah Kennedy, founder of the Irish Wedding Blog. Hello, welcome. Hello. How are you? Thanks for having me. We have so much to 
talk to. Can we jump into wedding presents? Go. Is that yeah. okay? Because yeah. you just kind had a like conniption. A family member, like a yeah. kind of in. A, it's okay. Someone. If you like not, them, you're someone. Someone, a distant relative. Initially, what would that be? Yeah. Around? So look, if you're attending the wedding as a couple, a distant relative, not close friend, that might be anything. Now I did this as a poll, so this is not me saying this is what you should have. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Couples told me they do. So that can be anything from about 100, 150 up to 200. Now, with family members, when I ran the same poll, they were coming in at anything. Now, the lower end was about 200, but pretty much 400 was sitting in at that, at that average. 400? Yeah. So your brother's getting married. <laughs> Cough it up. Is your sister okay. married? Cough it up. Sisters Does get married. She's getting well. married, so both yeah. of them are getting married. I don't know what to say. <laughs> I was yeah, just about to say, we did an extra gig yesterday, so just put that. Nice. Yeah. And that's then right. we'll do five yeah. other extra gigs, and you might be able Look, to afford to go to the wedding. It's not a target. This was just a poll that came back, so just to bear that in mind. But, yeah. but it is it also, is, it's, it's a lot of money. Like, I'll never forget when we, a bunch of us, Irish people, went, we were all at an English wedding. And yeah. then when she was opening cards in front of us, and 20 pounds were falling out, we were like, what is wrong with these people? It's like, a very it's different ballgame. We are over the top when yeah. it comes to, let's, to presents. Let's yeah. go to planning, because, yes. to be fair, you, you deserve the money. What about co-hosts? Co-hosts, how much do <laughs> they have on, to... be quiet now. A thousand. Talk to us about planning. So, um, if you get engaged, is it straight into... What, what are the go-tos must kind of get booked straight off the bat? Right, well, look, initially when somebody gets engaged, the initial reaction is to jump right in because it's so exciting, it's such an emotional time. So everyone's, you know, well, apart from wearing, right? But anyway, most jump right in. What I always say is take that time out just to yourselves to figure it out because the main thing that happens to couples, they might start talking about, well, I think we might do this and we might do that. And everybody has an opinion on it and starts crushing their spirit and then they don't know what they want. Mm -hmm. So take time out as a couple, sit down with the two of you. The first step I say is just get on the same page. You're having a chat because you might be going off on one tangent saying, oh, I like this, this, this. And then you talk to your partner and they're like, sorry, I thought we were we'd go abroad maybe mm -hmm. or have something small. So you want to actually have a little yeah. session where you, you really get on the same page and you're talking about the finance. Now, for a lot of couples, the first time they actually talk about money and coming together with money is around the wedding. Uh -huh. Not for everyone, but for the majority. And people have very different money mindsets. And I think we've, we've, we've heard about this yeah. before, but a lot can unearth around money. But as well, you have to remember with the wedding, you're looking at roughly the average cost of a wedding at the moment is being bandied about a 30K, roughly, right? Now, you don't have to go and do that, by the way, but this is... Sorry, sorry the, the average cost the in average Ireland cost. of a wedding. Yes, mm -hmm. right? Now, that's inflated by various different things, how big, small, whatever it might be. It's not a target, right? That's what I always say. But Sweet. say you do go for the standard average wedding, right? And that's what you're going after. You have to think about, can we save 30k in a year? Two years? What's it going to be? Has somebody got money in, the, in, in savings? Are parents going to help? Do we need to get a loan? Like, what way are we going to attack this? And you need to have a serious conversation about that. Otherwise, you are going to get into a lot of stress and a lot of debt. <laughs> so you want to get but, that laid out. Yeah, I suppose a lot of people, it is kind of like, you know, you've heard before, you know, hopefully we get good wedding presents because that's paying for the wedding. Like, yeah. There's a lot of stress there. But and that's it's not always a given. It's, uh, can I also just say, a lot of people, if they're rushing into it, there is an engagement bubble that people there should is. enjoy. They should. I, I completely agree. And I think, you know, it's it's one year out of your life that you'll never get back again. So I always say really, really yeah. cherish that because there's a lot of parties, there's a lot of socialising. It's a really, really lovely time. So don't be rushing in because you have to be ready. When you go to book things, you need a lot of deposits. Like if you're okay. going to a venue that, you know, it could be, you know, private estate, whatever, that could be about three, 4K deposits to put that in. You need to be ready with the cash to go on that. So, you know, and you need to talk about your numbers. The numbers are really your 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 your, your catalyst to the decide how the That's wedding the is going to be. One. It's the hardest one. And not everybody's always on the same page, but also you may have in your head, we want to do a wedding of 120 people. We want to get married in such and such castle. You go there and they're like, well, for the date you want, you need a minimum of 150 guests. So all of a sudden, this is a whole different style okay. of wedding. So you need to really understand, get on the same page and then you create what's called, I suppose, the blueprint, the big picture, the vision for your day and be really clear with it. When you get that done, then go and shop because you've laser focused down what you're looking for rather than going, I like the look of that, I like the look of that, shop, shop, shop and make wrong decisions and have buyer remorse later on when you're only a few months out. Just take your time and really just, just enjoy the shopping of it. Is that a tip for the stress of it? Because it can be an extreme... Like, it's a time to enjoy and really Absolutely. do embrace the enge yes. engagement bubble. It doesn't last forever. It does. I mean, <laughs> well, <laughs> straight but, in. But, uh, like, it is a stressful yeah. time, though, and particularly getting closer to the wedding yes. when you're, yes. you know, it's getting close to the big day. Do you have any tips 
on dealing with the stress? Yeah, so I always feel once you kind of map out your wedding and you know exactly what you're looking for, you've booked, the, the first things you book are really the date sensitive things because that's, you can't do anything without picking the date. So once you get that done, you need to kind of look at what's the overall workload we have. And if you can lay that out as a couple, and lay that down, start thinking about, we have a bridal party to help us. We've got people working in the industry that are our suppliers. What can they do to help us? And is there anybody outside of the initial bridal party that might be able to help? Delegate early yeah. so you know, OK, I'm going... And split it between yourselves. So don't think about one person's doing everything and then just vetting it with the partner and saying, do you like this? Yeah, turning up. You take the cake, I'll take the band. You do this, you do that. Yeah. Ma'am, I know you really want to help out. OK, can you do this? Mother-in-law, will you help us with that? You know, really try and, and get people working for you. I have tr oh, There's so many things I want to ask. Have trends with weddings changed since COVID for people? So, slightly. So, I suppose with COVID, it's opened people's minds to see that there are possibilities to do other things than what we see as being the, the traditional wedding. So, that's been a great thing because people are opening their minds saying, do you know what, I want to do something small, city-based, you know, and, yeah. and work that. Um, others are so grateful that we have normality back and are going hell for leather and enjoying that. The biggest trend I'm seeing is coming off, obviously, the back of COVID, cost of living crisis and what that's kind of trickled down into is that the cost to get married is getting higher. So rather than people getting married within a year, which would normally have been about the 12 month mark, they're going out okay. 18 months to two years because they need to save. Um, uh, when, I'm, when I've gone to fire and weddings, it's always been kind of wedding planners that have done everything. Yep. So you need someone who speaks the local language and everything. In our, and when I watch like grand designs and they don't have a project manager, I feel like crying yes. and shouting at them going, it's going to cost you extra in the long run. Is there a lot, is there anything to be said for wedding planners or is, is, have people dreamed about this day? A lot of people and they want to do it yeah, themselves. Yeah, there, there's, there's something inside of a lot of people that want to do the project and okay. they want to do it together as a family, as a couple right. and they know what they want. And I think in Ireland, a lot of our suppliers are brilliant and they make it very easy for okay. you to go and do it. Right. Um, now, if you're going abroad, it might be different, but if you're very time poor, absolutely get a planner. And do you know what? Even if there are certain areas, you may draft a planner in at different stages because planners actually save you money in the long term because they're well connected, they shop around and they can shortcut all of the messing for you. And they can take the stress out of the day as they well. Can. And let you enjoy they can be it there well. to run it. Exactly. Uh, listen, Sarah Kennedy from uh, the Irish Wedding Blog, thank you so much thank for coming you. in. And we've got the ultimate wedding planning morning. guide as well. Yes. There as well. There Stay in the bubble, guys. It's amazing. It's amazing in the bubble. We'll talk to you on Ireland Day and very shortly. It's lovely. Good morning, you're very welcome back to the show. We have loads still to come. We do indeed. He's regarded as one of the most influential doctors in the UK. Author and podcaster Dr Rangan Chatterjee helps us reset our body and mind for the year ahead in just eight minutes. It's going to oh, be great. I'm looking forward to boom, boom, boom. Uh, the Banshees have been sharing it one big last night at the Golden Globes Award. We're going to discuss the full list of winners before 10 o'clock. Alan, what's happening on the catwalk? Well, Mirren, we're taking inspiration from super stylish celebs. What celebs? Are we taking a style advice from oh, Lorna? Oh, so many. Kim Kardashian, Kate Middleton, we've got Queen Letizia of Spain. Lots of different, very Ooh. eclectic mix of people today. But it's Queen how you kind of... Queen who? Yeah, Letizia of Spain. Do you never hear of her? No. She's, oh, she's fabulous. Does she wear she's stuff like, like this? Um, I'd say she does when she's not on camera. <laughs> okay. Definitely. Um, we've got lots of different mix of things. January's a really hard time in, because we're in between seasons. So what do we go for? So I've picked some kind of wardrobe essentials all inspired by some celebrities. Okay, yes. there we go. I've never heard of Queen Letizia from Spain, but there She's we go. She's big in the style world. Is she? She is, Queen, yeah. Queen Queen all over Pinterest. Queen Letizia, there we go. Now, Derek, They're going to say that all day. Come on, Derek, have you heard of Queen Letizia? <laughs> yeah, of course I have. She lives here in League Slip. <laughs> There you go. Anyway, lads, begun, uh, it's beginning to brighten up here finally. Still the rain coming down here uh, in County Kildare. But plenty of showers out there right across the morning. But lads, I know you were talking about energy drinks a little bit earlier on. We saw a couple of kids passing here on their way to school and they did have them in their hands as well. So parents seemingly are happy to give the kids energy drinks before they even hit school. So there we have it. I know, we see that all the time. Those monster Red Bull, all those energy drinks, yeah, of course. Shop, it's mad, and they're always slagging me about my water. No, you're very welcome back. We've been talking all morning about the shortages of medicines yeah. in pharmacies at the minute. We put it out there and asked people, have you had difficulty getting medicine? You said, Al, you struggled. I was trying to get a cough well. bottle because I've had this cough. And so many people seem to have this cough that just uh, mm. won't, won't shift. 
and one chemist just didn't have anything. I mean, yeah. the fear of Calpol for parents out there <laughs> who are desperate to get Calpol into so the kids. Uh, so the winner, result. yeah, the winner is uh, well, it's not it's winner, not winner. It's winner, yes, all no. right, winner all right. So seventy percent of people have struggled to go into the chemist to be able yeah. to get certain. And when you're talking about like <clears throat> diabetes tablets yeah. or heart pressure tablets, that's where you you sort of and go. Yeah. Brenda said the week of Christmas, I went to pick up my husband's diabetic meds, which one injection. Um, uh, which is one injection. It was all out in Ireland. I heard it was because it was also being prescribed for weight loss. No consultant on duty, so the GP prescribed another, but not without fear and hassle, as it was indeed Christmas week. This is the diabetes medica medication Omprick, um, which people think the Kardashians used to lose the, the weight before the Met Gala and influencers are now oh promoting God, it really? as a weight loss medication, but it's more in America and Australia. We had a uh, pharmacist on as well, just asking the government to let them have more authority to be able to give out different prescriptions yeah. and drugs as opposed mm. to... To have to go back and forth to your GP. Uh, and when we're seeing the backlogs and the trouble and the pressure that GPs like, and hospitals yeah. are under, it makes complete sense. Like your pharmacist there qualified who knows what medicines are, what, what is it in a certain medicine, and if you get an alternative, it's like... It just makes sense that they should be allowed well, to do it. We have the right man to talk to about it next as well. I'm sure it's the same over oh, in, in the, the UK, UK yeah. as well. Up next, it is host of the Feel Better, Live More podcast, Dr. Rangan Chatterjee, is going to talk mental health and maybe shortages happiness. of medicine. No, no, no. Happiness. Happiness. Okay. happiness. You happiness. Yeah, we're chatting that after the break. Our next guest is a GP, a broadcaster, an author, and host of the number one health podcast in Europe. Then, please welcome Dr. Rangan Chatterjee, live from the UK. Good morning to you, Rangan. Great to have you with us. Um, yeah, morning, guys. Thanks for having me on. No, it's an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Uh, yep. We were chatting about the podcast earlier on as well. You are a GP. You've practised for over 20 years. You have five books, as we say, many other caps. How important is it, though, as a GP and with that medical qualification to try and spread the word and that good word to as many people as you can? For me, it's really important. You know, I became a doctor to help people. I know that's quite an obvious thing to say. I think most people in healthcare start off with that in mind. And what I've realised over my career is that 80 to 90 percent of what we now see as doctors is in some way related to our collective modern lifestyles. Now, listen, I want to be really clear. Uh, I'm not putting blame on people. I understand modern life is tough. It's stressful. Many people are feeling under pressure in terms of economic pressure and job pressure. But nonetheless, we have to accept that actually all of our lifestyle behaviors these days are impacting our health, not just obesity, not just type 2 diabetes. Even things like anxiety, depression, gut problems, insomnia. And so what I was learning, guys, is that I was trying to share the same information with all of my patients. And I realized when my BBC One show came out in 2015 that actually the media can be very, very powerful. If you can put really good information that's positive, that's uplifting, that's not talking down to people, that's not telling people how to live their lives, you can really make a big impact. And that's what I try and do with my podcast this week. And I think, you know, I often ask myself, why has this podcast become so popular to the point where, you know, as you mentioned, one and a half million people are consuming episodes every week now. Like, I couldn't have imagined that five years ago. But I think people are keen on simplified health information that really matters to them in their lives. So going back to your original question, it's really important to me that I can use my knowledge to try and spread the word that health is not as hard as you think it is. My job is to aim, well, my aim is to try and simplify it for people. Um, Rangan, I, I found with friends of mine who are GPs, uh, especially during the pandemic, when um, medical issues became the news, like that was what people talked about from an unqualified uh, position, that friends of mine were incredibly frustrated going, that's not true, that's not true. And there was an awful lot of, as you, uh, the Americans would say, fake news going around. So do you find that in your way that you were, you were there to counteract and go, OK, there is truth and there is fake in this field as well? Yeah, look, I'm very open-minded. I genuinely respect everyone's right to have an opinion on whatever they want. I, I honestly do. What, uh, to, to your point, I do think there's something uh, on my podcast, the fact that I 
have been a practicing doctor for over two decades, right? That's tens of thousands of patients that I've seen now. I do think that gives a certain gravitas to it. So I can talk to all kinds of different people. It's not just scientists. Sometimes it's personalities with really interesting stories because I think it's through stories that we learn. And I think that's one of the secrets of the podcast's success. It's not just you know, scientific dry health discussions every week. In fact, it's not that. It's about fun, engaging conversations. But I do think the fact that you know, I have all the ticks, you know, Edinburgh University, I have an immunology degree, I'm a member of the World College of GPs, a member of the World College of Physicians, I have all these qualifications behind me. I think it means that people can trust the information that they get from me. Uh, you, you have your, I mean, it's a huge podcast, you've had huge guests, I think Matthew McConaughey was on recently, you talked to specialists in cold therapy, you talked to specialists in anti-aging. But it's a, it's a family project. It's you and your wife do this together. She produces it. What, what's it like trying to separate? Because work-life balance is a big thing at the minute. And, uh, yeah, you, know, you know, I think it depends whether you ask me or you ask my wife. You may get two different answers, I suspect. Um, but by and large, it's a really good thing. You know, when I met my wife, uh, what, when it, I think this month is 15 years since we got married, okay? So when I met my wife over 15 years ago, she was a criminal barrister in London. And she stopped working when we had kids for a variety of reasons for a few years. And it started off when she was thinking about returning back to work. She didn't want to go back to the bar. And I kind of needed a little bit of help with this new podcast that I'd started. And she just started to help me a little bit. And... None of us knew it would explode and blow up in popularity like it has done, but she's absolutely fantastic. Um, I'm not kidding you. She's such a wonderful, um, like she's so good at crafting conversations where they need crafting. Mm -hmm. Now, we have to be careful that we're not always talking about it, you know, when we're having dinner with the children, when we're out for walks at the weekend. So we've had to learn to put boundaries in, but by and large... I think it's a good thing because honestly, who's going to care as much yeah. about the quality of the content that goes out yeah. than me or my wife? I don't think anyone is. Yeah, no one wants to be sitting beside you at a dinner party. The no. doctor with the 75 degrees and the criminal barrister <laughs> producer no. wife. I mean, I'm bringing nothing to that conversation. We're really struggling with that one. <laughs> it's not good. You, you're, you're an author as well, and uh, I've read a couple of your books, and and you know, your, your one about stress was really interesting, but you released a really personal one last year, um, Happy Mind, Happy Life, in which you talked about your father and your father's passing and how you kind of equate it to the stresses that he put on himself in life. Was it, was it very hard to kind, of, to kind of open up in that way, Rangan? It, it was really. You know, I wouldn't have, you know, I'm five books into my publishing career. The first four books, I think, were very much me as an expert trying to mm. dispense my knowledge and wisdom to help people. But I think what's so special about the Happy Mind, Happy Life book is, yes, it's me as an expert dispensing knowledge, but it's also me as an imperfect human who's trying to get through life. And I opened up about my own personal struggles, my own insecurities. I think my podcast helped me do that. I realized through my podcast and all these conversations how important vulnerability is, how important sharing sometimes some of those parts of yourself that actually we sometimes keep hidden away. It's, it's actually very good for our uh, mental health and our well-being if we do it in the right setting. And yes, in that book, I shared a very personal story about my dad. Like, dad died uh, this March will be 10 years ago. Now, I can't believe it's, it's almost been 10 years from uh, lupus and kidney failure. But knowing what I know now, and I reflect back on dad's life, my dad only slept for three nights a week for 30 years. He was working that hard. It was brutal. Uh, he was chronically sleep deprived, chronically under stress. Yes, he was an immigrant to the UK. He came to build a better life for me, my brother, my mum, and his family back at home. But the cost of that was he lost his health. And... That may seem quite extreme, guys, but many of us are doing that on a on a less extreme level day to day. We think we can keep pushing it, working, blurring those boundaries between home and work, checking emails on Saturdays and Sundays. 
But the problem is, is that it will always come back to bite you. The question is when. So I don't say that to scare people. I say that to say, hey, guys, listen, I get it. There are times in the year where you have to push, you have to work hard, times in your career, perhaps, but constantly be reevaluating and going, is this worth it? Do I still need to keep pushing now? Yeah. Because many people don't realize they're burning out until it's too late, unfortunately. Yeah, you talk with that a lot, that sleep deprivation is related to so many chronic illnesses that we see all the time as well. Listen, January is a tough month for a lot of people. Do you have any tips? Because, you know, you talk a lot about happiness, but happiness is quite, a, it's hard, you know, to, to, yeah. to try and put a, put a finger on. Do you have anything for people going into the new year that you think will really add to them with uh, what has been a tough couple of years they've put behind? Yeah, it's a great question. First of all, I think you can break down happiness. And in, in my last book on happiness, I break it down to three things. Alignment, uh, contentment, and control. We probably don't have time to go into all of those now, but just let's think about that last one I mentioned, control. I'm talking about a sense of control, right? The world feels out of control the last few years. If you turn on the news, what's going on? It doesn't fill us with joy and optimism and hope. So if you can give yourself a sense of control each day, you help to insulate yourself from the uncontrollables out there. And one way you can do that with is with a small action, let's say every morning. One of the big problems at this time of year is that people think their motivation is going to last forever. They think, right, this year I'm going to make big changes. I'm going to go spinning every week. I'm going to eat organic food. I'm going to sleep eight hours a night. And if you can, fantastic. But for most people, they set the bar too high. There's two really important rules of behavior change, which I think people should follow. Number one, if you want to make a new behavior stick in the long term, you've got to make it easy, right? Because that means when your motivation runs out, as it always does, you'll still do it if the behavior is easy. The second tip is think about where you're going to stick on that new behavior. Ideally, you stick on that new behavior onto an existing habit. That makes it most likely you're going to do it. How do I apply that? I do a five-minute strength workout in my kitchen every single morning. And that's not because I have more motivation than anyone else. It's because I made it easy. It's five minutes. I do it in my pajamas. I don't have to get changed. And I do it while my coffee is brewing. That's a habit. I don't need motivation to make my coffee in the morning. And when I make my coffee, I get my phone out. I put my timer on for five minutes. And in those five minutes, I don't go on Instagram, I don't go on email, I do that workout in my pajamas. And that's why it happens, just like toothbrushing every day. So I would say start small and think about where you're going to put it into your life. Yeah, that, well, we can do that. People um, can definitely do I that. Even, I even loved your five minutes coffee or tea with your wife in the evening as well, just with no phones, no distractions. To have to chat. Simple things, small things like that make all the difference. Yeah, yeah the podcast yeah, is called it. Feel Better, Live More. It's incredibly interesting. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Rankin Chatterjee, for joining us this morning. Thanks, guys. Take care. Thank you so much. She's absolutely lovely to listen lovely to night. on that podcast. <laughs> Hello, a new year can mean a new style if you're adventurous enough, Anna. And if you're on the lookout for some new threads, stylist Lorna Wakeman has the answer with some celebrity influences. Good morning to you. Good morning. Let's get straight into it. And who are our first celebrity influencers? So Victoria first, Beckham. Yes. And I had never, no, I, I'd heard of King and Queen Carla, or what's his name, Carlos? Carlos, yes. yes. Yeah, but I yeah. haven't heard of Queen Leticia. Yeah, Leticia. So she's married to the son who's now the, the king. king. Yeah. Yes. And of she's Spain. a bit. Of yeah, Spain. of Spain. And she's a, a bit of a style icon herself. Let's very, take a look. Yeah, very classic, very elegant. So that's her on the left there, with um, always has a really good coat, mm -hmm. which I love about her. And the same on the right with Victoria Beckham. They love outerwear that brings a look all together. So we're taking inspiration from these two very stylish ladies. 
today and really recreating it in a very practical way. So I think at this time of the year where we're in between seasons, so we don't really know how trends are going to kind of play out on the high street okay. just yet. So starting with some key capsule pieces is a great way to start. So black coat, that staple long-term investment, not going to ever date and go over yeah. everything you own, which I completely love about it. But I think at this time of year, we want to kind of make things ease ourselves into the transition of spring mm. as well by starting to bring in a little color. Mm. So red is a really good balance for this without looking too festive. Oh, the yeah. print actually makes it look a little bit more fresh. And these are from Kate and Pippa and they're available from Nicola Ross in Nace. And one thing I like about this coat is that it's a slightly kind of slouchy shoulder mid length so just down to your calf so it means it's kind of universally flattering we go over dresses knits everything and it's it's not too heavy so it's a great spring coat as well so that's what you're looking for now as opposed to that heavy wool fabric and then the balance of the color is lovely the the block of red is actually a little Christmassy so by actually going for a print we're just making it a little bit fresher yeah. I love the shape of this dress the V neckline is really lovely and the sleeve I love the sleeve for universal all year round but what's really great about this dress is it just catches underneath the the breastbone and then floats out in this lovely pleated skirt so the two shapes of the two items the coat and the dress really flatter each other which it's is lovely the lovely pair of boots, then. and the boots these are like little western inspired and um, boots from pennies another big shoe trend that's carrying over from last year yeah. and if you don't want to go for the full cowboy boot look you can get that detail just in an ankle boot which is way more wearable and great with jeans and leggings just as it is with the dress. Very good. Lovely. Thank you. Jessica, lovely. that's lovely on you. Thank you so much for that one. Our second look, we're going to be looking at Gigi, Gigi Hadid. Hadid. Yeah, yeah, so this is about the this is about the kind of denim jacket, which is like the the the, the jacket shirt combo. Yes. Um, and Gigi Hadid is actually wearing a, um, a shirt that's by Fenty, which was Rihanna's label, yeah. which actually got discontinued last year. Yeah. Um, but she really actually honed in on some really good classic pieces like the denim look Miranda Kerr who's on the right is another big denim shirt jacket fan so how do we recreate this in a very casual easy to wear um, you do look? it like this we do it like this <laughs> and you know I like double denim as a theory but I just don't think it's oh, very you, easy you, to wear you wash your mouth double <laughs> denim is the best thing ever be witch girls I love you I am with you it's like you know living your best 90s life I think when you're in double denim it. but if it's not for you I like the contrast of the t-shirt and the leather trousers yeah. as well which I think is really good and this is from On Trend. This denim shirt doesn't actually have um, the, the looseness or the kind of flexibility of a lot of denim shirts. Mm. It's actually quite heavy so it makes it good as an outer layer and you can wear it on okay. its own obviously but as that little jacket look I actually really love this Yeah. Um, and it's easy to style as well. Um, the leather trousers are so comfortable because they're mid to high rise so they're, they're not coming up too high and yeah. they're nice loose fit and they're a wide leg so in terms of like footwear you've got a heel you've got a runner with all of your different options so if you're thinking about how do you start you know a new style for the year this is really where is a really good kind of place to start it's like creating your own little mm. personal uniform um, and then adding trends in over the season as we go along so start simple and then work your way through the season the combat pocket there as well my god it is it's nice. the 90s thank you so much Kelly. it is and you know the 90s is is still everywhere it's still hanging around even on the Golden Globes red carpet last night there Everywhere. was a lot We're of 90s coming that. through. Sure. <laughs> Jenna Ortega had a Rachel haircut from Friends. She I was like, did. don't you dare. Yeah, definitely, Kim definitely. K. So Kim K, this was a very <sighs> extreme look. God. Now, let's just say we're not going to make this exact look, but what it did they, What's she wearing? <laughs> It's a onesie, so, a leather onesie. I like the gilet. It is a gilet. Like it's like um, a puffer jacket with a, a cut with a sleeve. It's it's sleeveless. And this was Balenciaga, and it really kind of inspired um, a lot. You know, the the loss of sleeves on a lot of jackets. Yeah. And we saw that translate through the high street a lot last season. But it's a great transition piece. So this one I really love because it's got lots of warmth, but there's so much detail on it. You've got the contrasting color with a little bit of cream in it, so it kind of keeps a lighter color. To towards your face, oh, which I quite yeah. like as well. That's nice. Oh. Yeah, so it's not too dark 
you know, a look overall because we default to these colours all the time. Yes, the so one thing I'm learning as you get older, more colour around the face. Exactly. And you can get that in earrings. Bright earrings is something I've you learned. You can, and then it reflects off your face yes. better as well. Um, and I love the detail on this, but it's a great match for that knit, skinny jean boot look, which I think is lovely to have as a go-to look. Yeah. And that's one of the things I would recommend all the time. Just have <coughs> something in your wardrobe that you know you can put on and feel good in. And this would be something I love. The knee-high boots, a flat boot, is great at this time of year because it's wet and it's cold and any kind of legging or slim fit trouser will slide down into them. Mm. And I Pennies just, have done a great job with those. They, they look really great. Have. And the pearl, the pearl uh, button detail on the, the exactly. jumper is lovely oh. as well. It does. It's like looking for a point of difference in your sweaters, your knits, and it, it's a nice balance to the casual style of the puffer jacket. And these are from On Trend. And it's something I think that you will wear all year round. You know, it's kind of moving away from dressing seasonally to dressing year round. It's lovely. It's really, really, really nice. Our next one, we've got uh, Kate, Kate Middleton. Kate Middleton. So Kate loves a blue look. This is the, the so cobalt blue colour yes. of the season. This is what's yeah, coming through. It's definitely coming through. And funnily enough, the, the kind of Pantone colour of the year is magenta. magenta. So that's like you're very on trend with oh, your thanks. yes, your, oh, your magenta. I, I knew purple. that. Oh, I'm wearing um, this like <laughs> style of fashion in the adults. But, <laughs> you lost the will is. to live. Yeah. It? <laughs> the deviation from it, like those cooler tones, like blue, is great. And also, okay. blue is technically supposed to inspire like serenity and calmness yes. as well. And Viola Davis had a beautiful blue dress on she the She did, Golden and Gloves looked apps that was one of the, the top ones beautiful. for me. But it's, if you want to go for the blue look, but you want to break it up, it's like going for little kind of um, punctuate it with print or different colours underneath it. I love how uh, a bright coat can just take over an outfit. I think yeah. it looks beautiful mm. and it really catches. And then underneath that, I've got a jumpsuit. So if you've got something coming up this year, especially coming into spring, this jumpsuit is lovely because it's got such a light fabric and so easy to put on. There's lots of flexibility in it. And it's one of those ones where you can step into it and pull it right up over your body. So make it super. Just mm. gets suits so much. I love Isn't that. Isn't it Tanya? beautiful? Yeah. And it's, it's quite a long one as well. So you need a little bit of a heel with it just to keep the fabric up off the floor. And this outfit is from Kate and Pippa as well from Nicola Ross. But it does really show you how you can break up colour. If there's a colour you really 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 want to try yeah. there's so many ways that you can style it to make it practical that was lovely, lovely. Thank, thank you, you. Yeah. little bralla top as well <laughs> gorgeous <laughs> it's so nice uh, now coming up uh, last night of course was a big night for the Banshees of mm -hmm. Inna Sheeran we'll be discussing the Golden Globes after this break Now, <laughs> the 80th Golden Globe Awards took place last night with the Banshees of Inish Aaron taking home three awards in total. Right. We're not going to stop talking about it all the way through to the Oscars. Right. Let's take a look at winner Colin Farrell's speech. Martin McDonough, I owe you so much, man. 14 years ago, you put me working with Brendan Gleeson, my dance partner, and you changed the trajectory of my life forever in ways that I begrudgingly will be grateful to you for the rest of my days. <laughs> Brendan, I just, I love you so much. I love you so much. To get to, to cohabitate this creative space with you every day, all I did when I came to work every day was aspire to be your equal. I'm not saying I even got there, but the aspiration kept me going. And I thank you for that for the rest of my days also. It's a lovely He's speech. Such a dose. He lovely. did. It was a gorgeous he? speech. Actually, it's two minutes long. It's a super speech if people want to watch the full bit of it as well. It's Thank so Thank you, the donkey as well. Thank you, as Martin McDonough did when he won for Breast Screenplay. He's like, I was hoping that Jenny, Jenny the donkey was going to be nominated, but she's a woman, so obviously the Golden Globes won't <laughs> let her win anything. Um, it was gorgeous. Can I ask, though, so the Golden Globes, there's two winners. So, like, so there's two best yeah, pictures. They, there's two well, no, best actors, two kind yeah. of thing, is it? So there's best... Best Picture in Drama and then Best Picture in Musical or comedy, comedy, and they do that for actors as well. Okay, okay, okay. So, I mean, amazing it's the only for Colin Farrell. do that, like the Oscars and others don't do that. And Banshee's yep. finished here to win three. Like, that's huge. Mm. It's very good for the for the Oscars. And a lot of this, it is like a political campaign. You've got to go out there and campaign, yeah. but um, the, I think the movie speaks for itself. It's so good. Yeah, okay. Well, let's move on to a White Lotus as well, which is another one that uh, I think most people watched. Uh, Jennifer yeah, Coolidge, yeah, yeah, yeah. Stifler's mom. She's Brilliant. Let's take a look at her. She's so brilliant. Here, by the way. Wow. And uh, thank you, Hollywood Foreign Press. That really means a lot. Thank you. I, wow. I am. Um, yeah, I can. I, mean, I can put this down, right? No, I just. Uh, you did kill me off, but it doesn't matter because even if this is the end, you sort of changed my life in a million different ways. And my neighbors are speaking to me. I had such big 
dreams and expectations as a younger person. But what happened was they, you know, they get sort of fizzled by life or whatever. And, and you know, I thought I was going to be queen of Monaco, even though someone else did it. But, I, you know, I had these giant ideas, you know. Uh, she like, is so brilliant. She's so she's good in that brilliant. show. And the guy Mike White, so he, he wrote both of them as well. Yep. Uh, White Lotus, yeah. White, White Lotus as well, but uh, she's class. Oh, yeah. she's class. She's she's great. Wow. If you ever see her on Instagram and stuff. Wow. Some of the shows she's done over the years, Carl is such a fan of yeah. hers. And Eddie Murphy received the Cecil B. DeMille Award. It's like a Lifetime Achievement yep. Award. It, and they give it and have a look at uh, what he his acceptance speech. It's a blueprint. And I followed it my whole career. It's very simple. There's three things you do. just do. These three things: pay your taxes, <laughs> mind your business, and keep Will Smith's wife's name. Mouth. <laughs> there you go. Someone had to go there. Someone had to do I mean, it. If anybody it could do be... it. Eddie Murphy, Eddie Murphy, Eddie Murphy it's going to have to come up a few times and uh, he looks absolutely fantastic and he's got his Lifetime Achievement Award and of course he's coming back with Beverly Hills Cup 3. Is he? Very shortly, they're no filming way. it at the minute. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh man, so, that's great. But we saw there, we're not going to have time to do all the fashion, I did a lot of it on my Instagram this morning, but um, we saw Phoebe Waller-Bridge there who's going out with Martin McDonough, of course, director of Banshees of Inisherin, and she looked stunning. It's a star couple, isn't it? Yes, so they are too. such a star couple. Wow. But we had an epic film moment created created last night when two powerhouses of acting, Seth Rogen, can we see Seth Rogen? And Barry Keoghan, who was fantastic in the Banshees of Inishirin. Can we get to see their Would outfits? Would you say Seth Rogen's a powerhouse? No, of, I'm, I'm not. I don't think oh, he's right, not okay. a powerhouse at all. But, but Barry Keoghan, he's on the way to even bigger there's greatness. There's Seth Rogen, and now we've got Barry Keoghan, and mm. I thought Barry Keoghan looked absolutely amazing. His pouting was up there with the Jennifer Coolidge. Look at that for a suit and a oh pout. Wow. He looks amazing. So good. And what together... What does that remind you of? Their powers combined. Can you show us what it reminds us of? Do we have a picture of it? Dumb and Dumber. There we go. There we, there we go. got there eventually. Recreating uh, it. Fair play. They should have really stood beside each other, shouldn't I'm, they? I'm looking for Give the picture them. for them to stand beside each other. Well, the well done, everybody, on the, Absolutely. the benches of Inisher. Nice Three to have awards. a bit of good news yeah. for Ireland as well with all the doom and the gloom. Thank you for joining us. We have lots coming up on tomorrow's show. We're going to get tips from an Irish budgeting mammy. Plus, we'll have our resident TikTok doc here talking through the health headlines. And all the usual news, sport and weather you're waking up to. We'll see you tomorrow from 7. Have a great day. Bye-bye. See you later.